Coming up on Market to Market. Congress battles to prevent a patchwork of GMO labeling laws. A medical study attacks subsidized agricultural commodities. And two brothers feed an overseas market for fans of American pork. Those stories and market analysis with Darren Newsom next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, July 8 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. As world markets shake off the Brexit stigma, the Brits continue to suffer. The pound dropped to rates last seen when Reagan was in the White House. Unemployment was 7.5% and Wham's careless whisper topped the charts. Jumping ahead 31 years, the world economy is in only slightly better shape. According to the Labor Department, the unemployment rate rose to 4.9% in June. The jump was fueled by more people searching for jobs in a larger pool. Last month, 287,000 of those jobs were snapped up. The news boosted the Dow Jones Industrial Average well above 18,000. The new data has recession-fearing economists wondering if the Fed will raise interest rates. Big news moves the economy. Little details control the bottom line. To prevent a food fight over labeling, the debate over marking products made with genetically modified organisms shifted Congress into overdrive. With the weekend looming, the Senate parked their roller bags outside the chamber and broke through the first barrier. Josh Bittner reports. Sugar it has in one second. So I can compare these five products in five seconds. Which one? Oh, here's the one I want. I want one that does have GMO. I want one that doesn't have GMO. That's a GMO label. This is an obstacle course. This week, the U.S. Senate moved forward on legislation that would, for the first time, require packaged foods sold across the nation to carry labels listing genetically modified ingredients. This bill will ensure that the Vermont GMO labeling law, which went into effect last week, July 1st, does not end up costing America's families billions of dollars when they fill up their grocery carts. The move in Washington comes just as Vermont became the first state to enact a similar measure. A label that appears on MNM. But senators representing the Green Mountain state argue the Robert Stabenow bipartisan agreement, which seeks to prevent a state-by-state patchwork of GMO labeling laws, falls short. Let's be clear. This is just another shameful example of how big money interests are using their influence to enact policies that are contrary to what the vast majority of the American people want and what they support. Critics say the federal requirements would be less than consumer friendly and will run roughshod over state regulations. More lenient than Vermont's law, the Senate compromise requires any foods that include GMOs to carry a text label, symbol, or an electronic label where information could be scanned and accessed via a smartphone. This is something that my friends on the right do not necessarily like, and I know some of my friends on the left don't like, but it's right. And it's necessary now so that we can protect the people who don't know if this bill doesn't get passed, they're gonna be paying more food for no more value. Food industry groups, like the Grocery Manufacturers Association, which has fought mandatory food labeling at the local and national level, and commodity groups like the National Corn Growers Association, came out in favor of the Senate deal. There has been no credible scientific evidence that GMO foods pose any danger to consumers who consume them. While there may be little technical concern about the safety of GMOs on the market, Labeling advocates say not enough is known about their risks, and people have the right to know what's in their food. 
several food processors have already begun labeling efforts of their own accord. Bearing exemptions, loopholes, and caveats. And last year, the House voted to make GMO labeling voluntary. But the Senate blocked the measure. Without Senate action that we're considering today, this country will be hit with a wrecking ball that will disrupt the entire, the entire food chain. It's not about safety. It's not about health or nutrition. It's about marketing. Senate Agriculture Committee Chairman Pat Roberts and ranking member Senator Debbie Stabenow were able to salvage the current compromise from the wreckage. And third, senators voting in the affirmative. And even though the Senate passed the current proposal, the bill will still have to make it back through the House before it can go to the president's desk for signature. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. This week, the fight over obesity and declining health in the average American saw the punch count shift in favor of fewer processed foods. Attempts to combat the problem domestically have included attacks on sugary sodas in the city of Philadelphia. South of the border, a Mexican tax on junk food has cut sales, but any health benefits have yet to be revealed. This week, the journal Doctors Depend On released a study showing a potential connection between the halls of government, the farm field, and waistlines. John Torpy explains. A study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association this week concluded there is a probable link between the consumption of foods derived from subsidized crops and higher cardiometabolic risks. Those maladies include hypertension, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and diabetes. Of 10,000 participants followed by research scientists, those with the highest risk of serious health issues had a diet where more than half the food consumed was sourced from raw commodities that received government support. The study also drew a correlation between socioeconomic status and the amount of processed foods eaten each day. Those in higher income brackets spent more money on fresh fruits and vegetables, while those with less disposable income tended to spend money on foods made from subsidized ingredients. The study also concluded that a stronger coalition between agricultural and nutritional policies may have the potential to improve overall health for many adults. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. Making a business flourish is sometimes a chance meeting or pursuing a path others have long since abandoned. For two North Carolina brothers, it was a combination of both that started a profitable venture based on a single idea. Peter Tubbs reports. On a cool North Carolina morning, 184 hogs are slowly loaded onto a truck. A combination of unique breeding and specialized diet has earned their carcasses an 8,000 mile trip to Japan. But this export opportunity began 40 years ago with a humble spreadsheet. We wrote software for indexing pigs. We would measure the economic traits like born alive, 21 day litter weight, um, growth rate. Uh, we would measure back fat. The falling price of personal computers in the 1970s allowed the Ivies to analyze their data with greater precision and encourage them to experiment with genetics and feed composition. The results of their testing led to a four-way cross hog that gained weight well while being calm in the hog house. The resulting meat stood out from other hogs being raised at the time. You know, the industry was chasing lean, 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 no intermuscular fat. Uh, that product's very hard to cook um, and can be very tough. The hogs were different, their meat had marbling and a much higher fat content, which made the pork juicy on the plate. This marbling caught the attention of Japanese wholesaler Sumitomo, who was looking to import pork with some specific characteristics not normally seen coming out of U.S. hog houses. They came into the plant and they saw the pork that were based on these genetics, the four-way cross, and they basically said, that pork works for us. Started out with a tractor trailer load of hogs a week. The Ivies now ship more than 12,000 metric tons of pork to Japan annually. 
The partnership with Sumitomo came just after the Ivies had begun working with the Maxwell family to grow their hog operation. The Maxwells, the nation's largest turkey processor, had excess capacity at their Goldsboro, North Carolina feed mill, and together with the Ivies, grew a hog operation to over 70,000 breeding sows. Sumitomo branded the Ivies pork as silky pork. In Japan, the domestic pork is the, kind of the gold standard. And so we have the reputation of, of being not a commodity pork, but a special uh, dining experience that competes well with their domestic products. So we're very proud of that. The Japanese consumer is much more discerning than the American customer. While American households spend around 10% of their income on food, Japanese consumers spend more than 30%. The higher cash outlay is driven by a quest for quality and knowing as much as possible about the source of their food. The pursuit of the highest quality product remains part of the Ivy's business mix. The pair owns their own feed lab, which monitors the 750 semi-loads of inputs and mixed feed that pass through the plant each week. To guard against disease, every truck is washed before it travels to a farm using two different truck washes. At the plants where silky pork is processed, like this one in Rantoul, Illinois, Sumitomo places its own inspectors to help ensure the pork is being cut in the way Japanese consumers prefer. Yoki Miyawaki visits all the plants that process silky pork. Japanese consumer wants to have super safe products. Whatever it is, they want to make sure that it was produced under a safe production procedure and also wants to purchase stuff that is traceable. Although pork is a traditional protein source in Japan, it has been secondary to seafood. The westernization of the Japanese diet has included an increase in red meat consumption, especially among younger consumers. Learning the unique demands of the Japanese consumer has been one of the leading challenges for the Ivies. And they've really taught us a lot on how to, how to make food better and safer and, and, and taste good. So they've been a great customer and, and they've really, it's been a, a good learning experience because we think that the same thing is happening now in the United States. We believe that the con American consumer is adapting to the Japanese model. There are more and more people that want to know the story behind their food production. Rantoul Foods, which handles the majority of the ivy silky pork, is a unique part of the supply chain. The owners strive for accuracy and quality over volume. The line moves at a much slower speed than conventional pork plants, allowing meat cutters to make more precise cuts and ensure the product always matches Sumitomo specifications. Each package is sealed individually, dunked in a cooling tank to remove any surplus heat, and inspected before boxing. The pork will remain at 34 degrees for the entire 17-day trip to Japan, delivered fresh to Sumitomo for slicing and delivery to retailers. One cut that is produced at Rantoul is the single ribbed belly. American processors usually cure it for bacon. However, the Japanese consumer slices the belly for cooking. At plants like Rantoul, the spare ribs are pulled out individually, leaving the rib meat attached to the belly. The cut earns a premium in Japan and justifies the labor-intensive prep. The Ivy's data and focus on quality has given Japanese retailers the confidence to market silky pork next to domestic pork successfully. And the brothers have plans to expand their reach by looking for markets closer to home. We, we think we've done that in Japan and we would love to do that here in the States. American consumer deserves it. I don't think they've gotten it yet. From Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Next, the Market to Market Report. This week's market factors could be summed up as weather, weather, and South America. For the week, September wheat rose a nickel. The nearby corn contract lost a nickel and has shed 19% of its value over the past three weeks. A higher dollar and good weather wiped out last week's 63-cent gain as the August soybean contract plummeted 81 cents. August meal followed the trend going 27.90 per ton lower.
In the softs, July cotton added to last week's gains, bumping up 82 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, August Class 3 milk futures gained 3 cents. The livestock sector was mixed as the August cattle contract fell 75 cents, August feeders rose a dollar, and the July lean hog contract plunged 513. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index moved higher by 61 points. Crude oil fell 358 per barrel. Gold bugs had another good week as the August COMEX contract gained 1940 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index lost nearly 20 points to finish the week at 357.50. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Darren Newsom. Darren, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. I want to start off this market conversation with a question we got on Twitter. Okay. From Tim in Crookston, Minnesota. He's on Twitter at the $6 Wheat Guy. Mm -hmm. His question is, it's gotten ugly. <laughs> is the gig up? Ah. Uh. The weather remains the way it has over the last three weeks, two, three weeks, absolutely. Um, it's going to be very difficult to get buyers interested in this market. But we have to remember something. We're in mid-July. Okay, so maybe, maybe the argument could be made that the corn market's made. You know, maybe it could be, the argument could be made that, you know, this wheat crop is larger than anyone had anticipated. Soybeans have a long way to go. And we have a lot of international issues to get through. We've got changing numbers in both corn and soybeans uh, for South America and Brazil in particular. We've got the constant ebb and flow of the U.S. dollar index, uh, you know, the, 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 the screaming higher that we saw in it after Brexit. But, you know, still the, the, the tendency of, of the FOMC to be a little bit tentative uh, as far as raising rates. So there's a lot of things that could, have, that, that could happen. Fundamentally, though, Purely fundamental, looking ahead, if things stay the way they are, yeah, it's going to be very difficult to get these markets going up again. Okay. But fundamentally, mm -hmm. huge winter wheat crop. Mm -hmm. All the reports are still massive. Wheat, only grain on the week that rose. Mm -hmm. What happened there? Are we seeing some spread trading activity, or did we finally get to a point of value in that wheat market? <laughs> value? Uh, it was pity. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's just been beaten up terribly. Uh, I mean, we've got... 50% ending stocks to use domestically, globally. Um, there's just, it's very difficult to really get a strong foothold in this market. Now, in the case of wheat, uh, non-commercial investment traders are al already hold a very large short position in Chicago, and that short futures position in Chicago. There's little incentive to continue to sell at these levels. So you get a holiday shortened week, you get just the same old, same old, you get a little bit of rain through the southern plains and the Midwest, slowing harvest down a little bit, you buy back some of those contracts. Does it change anything fundamentally? No. You've got basis weakening, you've got spreads weakening, you've got the CME going to uh, bring about variable storage rates here in another week or so. Um, this market's still in, pro uh, still in trouble. You have the dollar going up, we can't sell anything. Um, wheat could be facing some really hard times here. And uh, we just have too much of it on hand. Harder times than we're facing presently. I mean, again, the wheat market, that's another one. We're looking at the chart right there on mm -hmm. the screen. Huge down move in the yeah. past, what, 20 trading days. Mm -hmm. How much farther can we drop realistically from a technical perspective? Well, I don't think you can go to zero. Uh, some would say that wheat probably should go to zero. Uh, but we're already talking about LDPs in parts of Kansas and other parts of the Southern Plains because basis is so weak, uh, futures market's going down. Usually when the futures market's losing ground, basis uh, starts to strengthen, but you're not seeing that this time around. That's because there's so much wheat on hand. Uh, harvest is going along relatively well. Uh, again, some hiccups because of, uh, because of weather, uh, but you know, we've got to find a way to get through these. Uh, I read one story uh, this week about these mountains of wheat because everyone's piling it on the ground waiting for fall harvest. Uh, we've got to find something to do with it. We've, you know, you know, it's going to go bad and that's going to make prices worse. Uh, we've got to find something to do with it before this market can turn around. Okay. Well, let's talk the corn market. Mm -hmm. Down a nickel mm -hmm. on the week. Um, we going to find a bounce here? Friday. Let's talk Friday. That okay. was an interesting day in the markets. We yep. saw a terrible week, yep. and then boom, a mm -hmm. little bit of an explosion. Yeah. Is that going to carry forward into next week? Depends. Okay. On what happens with the weather. All right. If it doesn't rain this weekend, and it's not a three-day weekend like what we had last time around when all these huge rains uh, hit the U.S. Midwest. But let's say we come out of this weekend dry. We'll start the market on a run. 
I mean, we'll see the buyers continuing to come into this market because as we went home today, extended weather forecast, 10 to 14 days, whatever it is, uh, we're calling for now hot temperatures over the Midwest, but some of these rains that we've seen stop. That these ridges and, and these weather patterns start to block some of these rain systems that have been moving into the Midwest. If that happens and if we get an extended 10 to 14 day period where we don't see a lot of rain, everybody's going to get excited about the corn market again. Now. Is the corn going to really be in trouble? Probably not, no. We've had a lot of rains here in early July. Uh, if, you, if anyone out there believes NASA's uh, weekly crop condition numbers, it's still pointing to a possible national average yield around 170 bushel per acre. So it's going to take a while for you know, the reality to get more bullish than it is at this point. Uh, but the market could still react and we could still see uh, at least short term the market bump up a little bit. Do you sell on that kind of a bump up or do you hope we get some crazy thing out of Brazil, USDA reconfirms well, Conab's numbers? Yeah, see that's, that's the thing. Um, Conab reduced their crop by 7 million metric tons. Uh, you know, the, the size of the Brazilian corn crop by 7 million metric tons. What that does is it basically offsets the expected increase now for what the U.S. is supposed to produce here in 2016. So, you know, it's kind of a wash. And, and so we're still looking at like 20 to 22 percent ending stocks to use in corn. Still plenty of global corn around. But what it might do is it could increase demand for corn. We've seen export demand stay steady, but not quite strong enough to get up to uh, USDA's June demand projection. What we need to see is increased business along that line to start getting ahead of that. All right, soybeans, mm -hmm. 81 cents down on the week. Mm -hmm. Big bounce again on Friday's trade. Mm -hmm. Does that carry into next week? Uh, probably not. Uh, I mean, again, it could if the weather uh, turns to a little bit warmer and drier. Soybeans are made in August, so there's going to be a lot of playing around here in July. What really happened this week is when Friday's, last Friday's CFTC Commitments of Traders report came out, uh, it showed that non-commercial traders had actually increased their net long futures position as of a week ago Tuesday. You know, it gets kind of confusing. But the bottom line is that they increased their net long. Scared the market to death. Everyone started running for the door at the same time. We saw a huge sell-off uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday at uh, different points. It tried to rally late in the day both times. Thursday it said, forget it, we're not even going to try to pretend down 60 some cents, you know, 50 some cents. Uh, and then, so we get 30 cents back. On, on Friday. Doesn't mean a lot. Um, could still see some liquidation next week, buying in corn, selling in soybeans, try to bring that spread back in line. Uh, but by and large, you know, I, I'm not ready to throw dirt on the soybean market yet, but I think it has a little more room to come down. Okay. Livestock, mm -hmm. live cattle, relatively stable, down 75 cents on the week. <laughs> Are we going to get uh, a little you, bit more Can outside? you believe you just said relatively stable <laughs> live cattle yes. market? What does that mean? It traded within a $20 range this week? That's stable. It wasn't they, limit every day. <laughs> there, that yeah. is a more stable market. Uh, I, I do think it wants to trade sideways in here. Uh, you know, we, we've still got plenty of supplies. We still have good demand. We're getting towards the end of summer. So uh, it just, there's really nothing outstanding in this market right now. We've actually seen the volatility, as you just mentioned, come down a little bit. It's starting to stabilize. I just don't see any reason for it to break out. Uh, we did see the Dow go back over 18,000 uh, this week. A lot of times that will leak over into the cattle market. You give it enough time, uh, more expendable income, more expendable income, and so on. Possibly going over into the beef sector. So it's it's possible we could see an extended summer buying season on some cattle. So you know, getting back up towards this high side of the range certainly not out of question. High side of the range, looking close to that 120. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Correct. Feeder cattle up a buck yep. on the week. Still room to run there? You know, losing, losing ground in the corn certainly helps the feeder cattle market. So, you know, there may be some room to run in the feeder cattle, but let's say that we don't get the rain, the corn market shoots up, tries to gain back 50% of what it lost here over the last two, three weeks. I would imagine that we're going to start seeing some sellers come back into feeders, not for any particular reason, but mostly just looking over at the corn market. Watching that corn market, Correct. and depending on whether or not live can make right. it run towards yeah, that. Yeah, you know, and again, if there's no real life in the live market, you know, let's say we're up a dollar one day, down a dollar the next, there's no reason for anyone to get overly bullish feeders at this point. You bet. Lean hogs, mm -hmm. that has been a market. We've talked about it weekly, mm -hmm. the strength that that market has carried. This yep. week, we saw the first real pullback in quite a while, down five bucks. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you from a chart perspective? It tells me that we've, we've, the money's kind of gotten tired of the hog market right now, so they're getting out. Uh, they rode it a long way, it did really well. I'm not saying that the hog market's all of a sudden turned fundamentally bearish. It hasn't, 
but I think we're going to continue to see some non-commercial, some, some investment selling coming into the hog market, pushing it down a little bit in here. I mean, the attention's starting to go over to some other markets. Going to pull some money out of the hogs. They've done well in that sector for a little while now, so I think they're going to let it pull back a little bit and most likely jump back in. Would you see it decline another three, four bucks next week if this money continues to climb out? I, I would say that's a possibility, yeah. I mean, uh, it depends on how much we have this market on the run. Losing, what, five dollars this week mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh, it certainly is a bearish signal for hogs. Uh, I would not be surprised to see another, lose another three, four dollars next week. Okay. U.S. dollar continues mm -hmm. to strengthen. Is that a trend that's going to continue on into the future? Until the United Kingdom comes out and says we were only joking. We didn't really mean that Brexit vote. That was just kind of misinterpreted by the media or whatever it might be. Until that point, yeah. These safe haven markets like uh, the yen and gold and, and the U.S. dollar index are going to continue to try to push higher. Um, we, saw the, the, we saw the June em uh, employment numbers here come out on Friday. Um, raises the question again, is the FOMC going to move on interest rates? I still think they won't, not for a while yet. Um, next time it comes around, that could be where the pressure on the dollar comes from. I'm reading some analysts said, you know, dollar's still going to collapse, technically, probably should. Okay. But these wild, with these wild cards keep coming in in its favor to keep moving higher. All right. Well, Darren Newsom, thank you so much for joining us this week. Oh, thank you, Mike. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market. But Darren and I will keep the market conversation going, including answering more of your questions during Market Plus, available on our website. While you're there, check out MTOM the newest podcast offering from the producers of the program. Listen as we go beyond the headlines to hear about upcoming stories and learn more about our market analysts, including Darren. Join us again next week when we find out how new wheat hybrids may come sooner rather than later. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.